Hey, I'm Reverend Alan Rupert, and I'm so glad you're here today. We're here in the German Primitive Methodist Church. The pews are empty right now. Dale Kecklock's here with me. He's our technical man. He's going to record this and do all the editing and all the rest of that. We're the only ones here right now. I wish you were all here. In my mind, the best place on the planet Earth is the corner of Jefferson to Division Street every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. I don't know if you know it or not, but when I stand on that porch and watch you people walk down the sidewalk and turn up and walk toward the church, I am so thrilled to see all your different faces. You come with your families, come with your friends. There's joy and there's happiness, and I just love seeing you every Sunday. Right now, we can't meet together. You know the governor's orders. But here's the deal. I'm hoping that no more than two Sundays do we have to miss because of this uh, effort to curtail the damage of this epidemic. And so if we could just keep that down to two Sundays, that'll be great. We'll do what we have to do, but I'm really hoping for two. We'll all pray that way too, okay? Anyways, I just want to talk to you today about things that we've been talking about in church on Sunday. And before I do that, I'm going to talk about a couple people we're praying for. Keep Reverend Johnson in your prayers. He continues to recover from uh, an infection that he's been treated for. He's home. He's making progress. That's great. Corey Bevanese, that's the little two-year-old child we're praying for, gone through that radiation treatment. She needs our prayers. She needs our support. We need to hang in there with her, okay? And Helen Mashala had uh, surgery yesterday. Actually, it's the last of the type of surgery she's going to have for some time in these hospitals around here. Helen did very good. She's home. That's great. We also want to keep in our prayers the patients, the people who have actually contracted this virus uh, in all the inconveniences and uh, toilet paper flying off the shelves. Uh, they tell me that meat is hard to come by. Uh, and all that, we lose sight of what's really going on. There are people that are really suffering right now from this disease. Their families are suffering along with them. We need to keep them in our prayers. The whole government apparatus, uh, officials, state and local, all over the United States and really all over the world, are working together to try and curtail this, uh, the damage and effects of this virus. I happened to be watching Italian TV the other night, and uh, when it came to the news broadcast, the first thing that they talked about, coronavirus, and actually on Italian TV, they had in subscript below, was talking about the situation in California and what they're doing in the United States to address this virus. So it's a worldwide epidemic, and a lot of people need to be prayed for. And I think I'm going to pray right now, and then I want to share something with you that I think will build your faith. We have a lot of different episodes in life that come and challenge us. We need strength to get through, not just the individual episodes themselves, but everything that happens. Bow your head with me and let's pray for a moment. Our Heavenly Father, again this morning, we have friends and family who have sicknesses, illnesses, uh, different challenges in their life things that they're attempting to accomplish and really need your help for. We ask you to minister to each and every one. Lord, put your hand on our friends and family and take care of them. And give them the health and strength that they need. We pray for our elderly at this time, largely shut off from the world, more so than normal. Can't even visit them in nursing homes now. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you put your hand upon each and every one of them. Soothe their hearts and their minds in a way that only you can do. And we'll be so grateful for that. Take care of the people we love. Lord, for the people who are suffering from this uh, virus, and in fact, those who've lost loved ones and the people around them, we ask your hand be upon each and every one. Please help these people. Restore them to health. Give them strength. We pray for the people who are trying to work together constructively to bring this virus to a conclusion, contain this, minimize the damage. Please help them, Lord. And we pray that you'd speak to the hearts and souls of men, women, and children all over the world. They might come together, we might all do our part and help this situation. 
and be constructive and productive. So our Father, we pray for our president and all our national leaders and all the world leaders and all those foot soldiers who show up every day and do the gritty groundwork of putting those plans into action to see that we get the best result possible here in this situation. Lord, thank you for all these things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is surely a terrible episode in our lives. For most of us, it's an inconvenience. And not much more than that. We don't know people who are infected with the virus, most of us. I've heard a couple cases of people who tested positive and uh, but the remoteness of that doesn't mitigate the real suffering that's going on over the world. But this will pass, like everything else does. In fact, I was thinking about the potato famine. They called it the Great Famine or the Great Hunger in Ireland, really in the 1840s. And there was literally mass starvation in the year 1847. One million people died from the potato famine just in Ireland. The suffering was exported all over Europe and over 100,000 people died because of the transmission of that uh, terrible uh, bacteria, this infection. And what happened was they actually say that that started in Mexico. And uh, some strain of a uh, infectious bacteria transmitted through the United States over the ocean, got into the potato industry, and uh, one of their major food, uh, food staples in Ireland became the source of catastrophe and disaster. A lot of people suffered, a lot of people hurt. It's a few pages in the history book now. It's all over and it's all done. It changed the course of the world though. Politics changed. Economies changed. People saw that they need to do things in a different way to try and avoid that, but that's what happened. How about World War I and II? Do you know that the estimates for the deaths, the estimated death totals of World War II alone are between 40 million and 85 million. 40 million is the low estimate. 85 million is the high. Imagine what that means. New York City, metropolitan area of New York is somewhere between eight and 10 million, I'm not sure. Let's just make the math easy and say 10 million. Multiply that 40 million times, multiply the population of Metro New York by four, and that's the low estimate of the death toll of World War II. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a catastrophe. That's not just life changing. That's world changing. It changes individual lives, but it changes the lives of people. When I was a kid, we had the oil embargo in the mid-70s. And what they did in central New York, and I presume down here in the Scranton area, was uh, they looked at your license plate, and if you had an odd number, last digit of your license plate number was odd, you could buy gas on an odd day. Uh, the first, the third, the fifth, the seventh of a month. If you had an even number, you could buy gas on even days. It was a great inconvenience, but it's gone now, and it's notes in the history book. Right here and right now, we have a new situation, and the government, our leaders, they're taking steps to minimize what's happening. You know, we're trying to isolate people. We've heard about uh, social media for the last, what, decade maybe, and people talk, now we're talking about social distancing. Brand new term, hot term, and everybody's aware of it. Try and keep people apart so they're not infected by people who are carrying this, this uh, virus and don't even know it. They say it takes about 5.2 days on average for the uh, symptoms to show up in a person who's infected. So we're taking great measures to try and minimize the damage, travel restrictions, work restrictions, keeping people separated. We just want people to come together, now we want to keep them apart. But that's what we're doing. Steps to address this crisis, this episode, uh, things to make this situation better. What I really want to talk to you about today 
is taking steps to address your entire life. Not just the individual episodes, but your whole life. The good, the bad, the ugly, the continuous real that starts, I guess we could say for these purposes, from the day you're conceived. And that the film starts and it doesn't stop. Really for all eternity. And we can address that entire life, that entire situation, that's what the gospel is all about. It's about bringing people to a right relationship with God so that their whole life is impacted, their whole eternity, the way you see the world, the way you think about yourself, the way you think about people around you, the way you think about right and wrong, the way you think about what's really important in the world. These things are all traceable to our relationship with God. And again, that's what we're talking about as we go through these uh, different passages in the Bible. I'm going to read a short passage from the book of Romans. The Apostle Paul wrote to these nascent, infant churches in Rome. We talk about cell churches nowadays. Well, that's what the early church probably was. They were little cell groups that were meeting in somebody's living room, uh, perhaps a storefront. We read about uh, in Philippi, where they met under a tree. Uh, uh, next to a river. And so people were meeting in small groups because the church was brand new. It was just starting to spread all over the world. In fact, Paul says, your faith is being talked about all over the world. Well, he wrote to the church at Rome. And one of the magnificent passages is this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us like this, and in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. In other words, we've been restored to fellowship with God. The animosity that was between us and God created by our sin, by our disobedience, by our ignorance, by our willful violation of the things that we know are right and wrong, the things God calls sin. Those things have been addressed and taken care of in Christ. And we have been reconciled to God by faith. That's the greatest thing in the world. Faith makes the gospel available to the richest and to the poorest and to everybody in between. Strongest, weakest, black, white, male, female, caste, society, it doesn't matter. It's all available to whosoever will put their faith in a God that so loves the world that he would send his son to die on our behalf. You know, we live in a cursed world. The world's not the way it was created by God. We even read in the early pages of Genesis about a Garden of Eden, a place of wonder joy and beauty, lushness, fruitfulness, pleasantness, where men, Adam and Eve, they walked with God. They communed with God daily. It was beautiful. But we don't see that now, do we? This pandemic alone ought to be evidence of the curse that's on this world. Just imagine these uh, pathogens that are invisible to the naked eye. I mean, you need highly specialized equipment to be able to separate and isolate and work with these pathogens that transmit the virus. In the case of the potato famine from a place like Mexico, and we're not talking about the high population concentration nowadays, we're talking about all the way from Mexico across a continent over an ocean into a potato supply killed millions. 
That's a cursed world. We live in a world where people we love most in this world, their bodies wear away and they die. And the same thing happens to us, every last one of us. The further down the road we get, the more aware of our age we become. When we're young and invincible, we hear about a pandemic and the government says, you know what, we need to cancel school or the schools decide that we need to uh, stop holding group meetings so we cancel classes and it turns into a spring break. Let's head for Florida and have a ball. I was that way. Maybe you too. When you're young, it's called irresponsibility. It's called short-sightedness. It's really called ignorance. And that's the way we are as people. When we're young, we don't ex exercise much wisdom. And when we get a little bit older, we look back at what we thought was wisdom and can't believe we operated on those conditions and we can't believe that we talked to people that way and can't believe the way we treated the people we love. That's a part of a cursed world. People that are very best to us are sometimes the people we treat the very worst. In fact, I was watching a movie last night about a rodeo star who was living in a nursing home at the time. And uh, I mean, he was uh, rough and ready. Ben Johnson played him. I don't know if you remember him. He's one of John Wayne's old associates. He was in a lot of the old John Wayne movies and he's a familiar face to many, not necessarily a familiar name. But Ben Johnson, a genuine rodeo star in real life, played this rodeo hand who had been consigned to a nursing home. His roommate was Mickey Rooney. And the rough and ready had become old, and tired, and weak, and vulnerable, and broken down. And that's a lot of our life. That's the cursed world we live in. What we need to do is reunite with our Creator reestablish a relationship with a God who is the source of life, who's the source of health, who's the source of strength, who's the source of, as the Bible says, shalom, peace with God, okay? Not animosity, not somebody who's running away from God to avoid his commandments and his will, but somebody who wants to be in partnership and communion with God, who finds out that God is the source of life and everything that's good and health and promise and hope. So people say at a time like this, where is God? That's a good question, where is he? The idea being behind that question, if God's so good, why does he let us suffer? Well, there's a longhand answer to this, but a shorthand answer is where is God? He was in the Garden of Eden walking with Adam and Eve and asking them to enjoy my garden enjoy my paradise but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil let me be the source of your wisdom let me your guide let me be your guide let me be your god i'll supply you with all the wisdom and understanding and logic you need to be a fully functional person in this world and to be able to make decisions and think things through yourself and Find the joy of discovery. I'll supply that all to you, but sadly they listen to the tempter. And next thing you know, they found themselves out of paradise. We find Cain going to the land of Nod. That's the land of wandering. Where's God? He was in the Garden of Eden. Where's God? He was on Mount Sinai. He was telling us from Mount Sinai through Moses' his servant, boy, if you will obey me, you will prosper. You'll have a wonderful life. You'll conquer your enemies. You'll conquer your foes. You'll have prosperity in the field. You'll have prosperity in the kitchen. You'll have prosperity in your families. You'll have a wonderful life if you'll just obey me. But Moses didn't even get to the bottom of the mountain and he found out men were already going in the other direction. Where is God? He's calling to us and he's giving us the help we need we're too busy not listening, trying to find our own way. Like the stubborn child who just grits his teeth and balls up his fists and he will not do what dad or mom want him to do. It doesn't matter what they say. 
As soon as he gets out of their sight, Katie, bar the door. They're gone. The prophets, they came to warn God's people, repent, turn from your wicked ways. Go worship the God who's giving you life. The God who gives you breath. The God who gives you health. The God who gives you hope. The God who has promised you that he has things prepared for you that are unworthy of comparison to any suffering, potato famine or otherwise, that you can ever mention. But we read again and again in the Old Testament and then in the book of Revelation, but they refused to repent. They refused to listen. They went their own way. Where was God? Begging us to come home to him, the source of life, the source of health, the source of eternity, the source of victory over death. Where is God? In the Easter season, we celebrate him hanging from a cross. Because God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever should believe in him, trust his love, trust his sacrifice on your behalf, should not only not perish, but have everlasting life. Taken into a new realm, the spirit of man filled with the spirit of God, given that eternal life that transcends everything that takes place in this cursed world and puts a person in a dynamic, living relationship with God the Creator, who speaks all things into being, and when he surveys them, he says, they're good. No, they're very good. When we take control, it becomes a cursed world. Men fighting with each other for power and for authority and for wealth and for preeminence. God says, I don't want you to live in that world anymore. I want to take you out of that world and I have a promise. If you'll put your faith in me, worry what's going on in the world. You know, that's interesting. We went to Wegmans the other morning. You know, about 11 o'clock at night, the governor said that uh, all non-essential uh, businesses were to be closed Friday and through the weekend at least. And so only things that were going to be open were grocery stores, gas stations, of course, uh, hospital facilities, medical facilities, and things like that. And so, of course, we said, gee, we better get to Wegman, so we better get there early. So when we left, it was still dark. Got our dog, Murphy, got him in the car. <laughs> Beth and I got together drive down to Wegmans. We got there about 10 minutes of seven. And the parking lot was uh, probably about a fifth full. A lot of people standing at the door waiting to get in. And uh, talking to a man and he was saying, oh, there's nothing in there. Meat, they limit you to two pieces of meat per family, but uh, there's no meat in the shelves. The toilet paper, severely and strictly limited, and all the rest of it. And I thought about a time before there were supermarkets, before there were grocery stores like that, before there was a Walmart where you could walk in and buy anything you need anywhere in your home or anything you really want, to a time when you had to grow the food out of the ground, or you had to work a trade, somehow you had to make something, or build something, or offer work in exchange for your livelihood. You didn't walk into a supermarket and pick and choose everything you want. That's a great convenience we have now. Folks, don't panic. You go into the store, they don't have what you need, they don't have what you want. Look around, think, what can I substitute for? We got Kleenex, if you know, pinch you can use Kleenex. I mean, there's a lot of different things we can do. We're used to an easy life and now we're being challenged. Let's put our faith in the God who uses these challenges to make us his children, to build strength into us. Our relationship with God, it's not based on how much money we can give him. It's not based on how much suffering we can endure. It's not based on anything more than his love for us. He's given us life. There's no reason for us to exist, but that God has spoken us into being, put us on the grandest stage conceivable, the world. 
the universe and says, enjoy it. Walk with me and enjoy this. Why should he have included us in his plan? But they looked through the, I don't know, the lens of eternity and said, I want to share my eternal power, my eternal grace, my eternal life with people like you and me. That's the God we put our faith in. And God's just. We just saw in the paper the other day or heard in the news the other day that, you know what? If you get arrested in New York City for burglary, robbery, theft, you won't be incarcerated. You won't be put into jail. You'll be given, I suppose, some kind of summons to appear in court and sent on your way. That's the way I understand it. And then when I hear something like that, and when you hear something like that, doesn't that strike you? That's just wrong. There's something very, very wrong. Now, I, they say they need these hospital beds and they need to be paying attention to this crisis. But we hear about these things all too often when there's not a crisis situation. And it's so unjust. And you can't live in a healthy world where home invasion is not really a crime anymore. God's world isn't like that. The cursed world is, but what God has for us, it's just. And your sin and my sin required a just payment. And that's what Jesus provided for us on the cross. It, the word atonement is used. Jesus atoned for our sins. If you look at that word in the dictionary, you'll find out that it comes back to the concept of to unite. We are united with God. Jesus has taken care of the just requirements, penalty, punishment for our sin, and for the sins of the whole world. Any man, woman, or child who wants can enter into a relationship with God because of what Jesus has done. The justice of God is satisfied in Christ's crucifixion. The love of God in Jesus, shown in his life of sacrifice, the Bible tells us that Jesus left his eternal throne. He's the eternal son of God. Concept that's beyond us. <laughs> we're not eternal. We're temporal. We have a beginning when we're conceived, a time when we're born, and we see a time when we die. We're told that that time at the end, it's really going to be just a transition to an, another stage of eternity. God is eternal. No beginning or end can't conceive of this, by faith we accept it. That eternal God shows his love for us and that he leaves his eternal prerogatives to come to this world and die on our behalf so that we might be atoned for, united with him. He wants us to be a part of his eternity. This cursed world, this is all a trial, okay? This is all a... Uh, Real time, real life uh, test, you might say. How bad do we want God in his justice, in his righteousness, even when it hurts us and when we have to be chastened? We want eternity or do we want to live in this cursed world forever? God says, I got something so much better for you. You come with me. The love of God seen in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And finally, the ongoing fellowship with God, eternal life in Christ. The evidence, an empty tomb. I know uh, some churches have already canceled their Easter services. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, but we'll not cancel Easter. We might, I hope not, we might not meet in this room on Easter Sunday. But we'll celebrate Easter. Jesus Christ, alive, an empty tomb. Apostles, first hard to convince that what they were seeing was really true. That the things that Jesus told them was going to happen, that they had really come to pass. Women met with angelic beings or angels, and they came back and told the story. And the, the Bible says that the apostles thought they were mad. They thought they were confused. They thought they were out of their minds. But Jesus appeared, not only to the apostles, 
doubting Thomas. Yeah, he went and saw him because he loved Thomas. Peter, who denied him three times, yep, went and talked to Peter personally. Made Peter to know that he loved him and that he was forgiven. He went to all the apostles and appeared. And the apostle Paul tells us there was over 500 people who physically met with the resurrected Christ, physically saw him. And that's the evidence of this eternal life that God has for us that turns these sufferings, these episodes, these disappointments, these hardships into productive things that prepare us for an eternity with him. Do you believe that? I can hardly conceive of it. But when I come to know God, when I came to know God, when I experience His grace in my heart, I sure believe it. Because it sounds just like the God who comes and assures me in my heart that no matter what, Alan, I love you. He loves me and He loves you. That's what this is all about. So, as I said, We'll have difficulties in life. This isn't the last one. It's not the first one. It's not the last one. We will have difficulties. that will crop up periodically all through our life. And for some people, they are sustained episodes. But there's a relationship with God that overcomes the world and all of these things. And it's all available by faith to whosoever will cry out to God and ask him for forgiveness, for mercy. Ask him to include you in his life, in his promise on every page of scripture, and in the hearts and souls of every man, woman, and child that's ever put their faith in God. The answer is always, yea, amen. I love you. I've been waiting for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your holy word. Because again, Lord, the human eye can't see and the human ear can't hear and the human mind can't conceive the things that take place behind the scenes of this cursed world we live in. But your spirit has revealed them to us. You spoke to prophets and apostles and they've written their things in the scriptures and we read and meditate and rejoice over them. And the Holy Spirit of God speaks to our heart and assures us that we are loved and we are your children and there is better days ahead. Father, fill our hearts with the hope that's found in Christ and it's in Jesus' eternal and holy name we pray, amen. Now ladies and gentlemen, again, hope I see you real soon. God bless you, we'll be in touch. Thank you.